Kia ora tato. No mai, hare mai. Welcome to North Asia Cape's third and final post-COVID webinar for this year. We're calling it Pathways to Reopening in 2022. I'm Charlie Gao, Director of North Asia Cape, and I'll be your host for this event. Our organization, the North Asia Center of Asia Pacific Excellence, is a New Zealand government funded agency hosted by the University of Auckland. Our mission is to support New Zealanders to become more knowledgeable, capable, connected, and ultimately more successful in the region. As part of this mission, we host regular events and webinars on topical issues that are relevant to New Zealanders as they look to engage with Asia. And this is why we started this series last year, really as an effort to help New Zealanders to understand COVID developments in Asia and the implications for New Zealand businesses and our wider society. I know that most of us are really fatigued with thinking about COVID um, and with Zooms in general. Um, I know that I'm both of these things. Um, having said that, one of the most topical, I think, um, important things that we're all considering at the moment is how are we gonna reopen? How should we think about uh, how to reopen our economy, our borders and our society in a way that is safe, uh, fair, scientifically robust? Um, how do we allow our businesses to thrive again? And how do we do it in a way that's sustainable? So I think as we do this thinking in New Zealand, it's really important for us to think about how are our important trading partners, especially in North Asia, thinking about these same issues. Um, and through that, maybe we can learn some things for ourselves here in New Zealand, but also it's gonna help us to be better partners, and interact better with our important partners in Asia. Um, today, we're really in for a treat, as we have three phenomenal speakers zooming in from us from Asia. Um, each speaker is not only a New Zealander, each speaker is a champion for New Zealand in Asia. So we have Ambassador Philip Turner, based in Seoul. We have Catherine O'Connell joining us from Tokyo, and we have David Mann joining us from Beijing. So to introduce our first speaker, His, Excell His Excellency Philip Turner, Philip was appointed New Zealand's ambassador to the Republic of Korea in March of 2018, and he is concurrently also ambassador to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Philip has pr previously been posted as a diplomat to Tokyo and Brussels. He has led Fonterra's China business based in Shanghai and served in a number of senior roles for Fonterra. Philip, thank you so much for being with us today and over to you. Uh, kia ora, kia ora koto and kia ora um, Charlie. Anyong Shimika from Seoul, it's great to be here. Um, what I would like to do, excuse me for just adjusting my screen slightly, is talk briefly about the overall COVID situation in Korea um, and a bit, a bit then about what it actually feels like being here on the ground, especially for business folk. Uh, and then finish off with a bit on the, um, the New Zealand business situation, how our trade's tracking with Korea. Um, and I'll take about 10 minutes and Charlie will interrupt me if I go on too long, I hope. Uh, so first off, I think like in, in common with my colleagues in Japan and China, you know, I think we're all feeling relatively blessed to be in a part of the world which is doing a pretty good job, I think, of, of managing the pandemic compared with some other less favored parts of the globe. Um, Korea has done this in a very different way from New Zealand, but oddly in some ways uh, with similar results. Uh, we, so Korea has avoided uh, any lockdowns uh, pretty well altogether, and it has kept the borders open throughout the pandemic, which is quite a feat. Uh, and yet despite that has managed to keep the in number of infections and the impacts uh, at a manageable level, including today. Uh, so the economy I'll talk about shortly, uh, but just to focus on the, the kind of COVID measures for now, uh, as I said, they, they kept the borders open, uh, avoided lockdowns and managed the, the, the pandemic through uh, some restrictions on movement through widespread mask wearing and so on. And that's been pretty successful. Uh, I think partly because you've got a, a really good record of public compliance here a lot of respect for government and medical professionals, 
maybe helped by a dose of confusion and higher, you know, respect for hierarchy. Uh, so public um, behavior has been pretty good. Uh, and of course, they have an excellent medical system and infrastructure in Korea. So that's uh, enabled them to manage the pandemic. And then as Delta has arrived here as everywhere, um, like New Zealand, they've got into a race to get vaccination high as quickly as possible in order to be able to reduce other restrictions. Uh, and then the numbers are very similar to New Zealand. Vaccination rates, they measure them here as a proportion of population rather than just the eligible uh, population. Uh, and they're over 70%, you know, totally vaccinated for the whole population, which is pretty damn good and very similar to New Zealand. So given that uh, from the beginning of November, Korea moved to what they call living with COVID or with the corona, as we say in Korean. Uh, and that's a recognition that um, as a New Zealand, we get it that you know, we, we get to live with this thing. Uh, and some restrictions were eased from the beginning of November. Um, predictably, as in other countries, that's resulted in a bit of a surge of infections. Uh, and so just this week, the government's had to kind of just rejig a bit, dial back a little bit on its planned uh, removal or re reduction of restrictions. Um, so they are looking, for example, to uh, moving quickly now to provide booster shots, particularly to the elderly. Um, as in other countries, we're seeing, um, even in Korea, pressure on the hospital system, ICU beds, um, you know, serious hospitalizations, particularly of, of older people. So um, the, the government is, is um, basically just slowing down a little bit, the removal of restrictions, um, and they'll continue to watch the numbers as we go forward. But look, the situation on the ground, as far as individuals and business uh, is concerned, is pretty good. Um, everyone wears masks. Uh, you can travel around pretty well anywhere you want. Um, the main restrictions still remain, uh, are still there are on big events. So uh, quite frustrating for business and for embassies, we are still largely unable to hold any large events, receptions, conferences, promotional events. We are able, however, to hold uh, smaller events, uh, lunches, dinners, meetings with, uh, with people. There's quite a lot of Zooming, obviously, and uh, you'll often find that uh, because of COVID, certain offices are, are, are closed down for a day or two. Uh, but generally, it's not difficult to get to meet people. Uh, and we can certainly, as the embassy, uh, help um, businesses and others with uh, lunches and dinners. And in fact, just last night, I was delighted to have um, the head of a, a major New Zealand tech company who's in Korea, traveling under MIQ, out of, well, if you go back into MIQ in New Zealand, uh, but he was able to come to Korea. We had a dinner last night with a dozen or so customers, contacts, uh, distributors, um, and uh, you know, put on a show for them with New Zealand food and wine and so on, and that went really well. So um, it's, it's not a bad situation all round, um, and we are starting to see travel um, ease up a little bit. So for example, um, Korea now has travel bubbles with the likes of Singapore, Thailand, Guam. Um, travel from New Zealand uh, is, is now quite possible. You need, if you're vaccinated since July, you can come into Korea without quarantine. You need to be PCR tested on arrival, but that's it. Obviously there's a difficulty about going back to New Zealand, but that's an, an issue at the New Zealand end, not Korea. Um, airlines have kept flying, Air New Zealand and Korean Airlines have both kept flights going through the pandemic. And Korean Airlines is a bit of a symbol announced early in November that they are returning to a scheduled service to Auckland rather than just occasional charters. And that's an indication that they are planning you know, for a resumption of, of, of more travel shortly. Um, so it's a pretty good situation um, for, for COVID. And, and what we're seeing on the, on the trade front is interesting. Um, there's obviously been a huge impact in areas like tourism and education students, that's just stopped. Uh, but that's been largely offset by really strong performance, particularly in the food and beverage sector. So um, we just did some, some numbers this week. Uh, Korea has actually bounced up to be our number five, our fifth largest trading partner. Um, that's largely because um, other countries have kind of slipped back a bit. Um, Trade is, is basically steady with a little bit of growth, particularly in food and beverage. 
um, offset by declines in some, some other areas. Um, our, our business with Korea is distorted a bit by big uh, ticket items like oil and um, timber and so on. So if you normalize for that, we, we see really good growth, particularly as I say in food and beverage. As people are locked up or have been, sorry, not locked up, but spending a lot of time at home in Korea, um, they have acquired more and more of a taste for New Zealand uh, wine, uh, New Zealand fruit, New Zealand meat and dairy and so on. So just to, to share some, some good news stories there, wine export, exports are really uh, exploding. New Zealand is the fastest growing wine exporter to Korea. Um, and in products like um, Manuka honey, uh, what else, avocados, uh, doing really, really well. Uh, meat and dairy, uh, we cannot keep up with the demand for New Zealand beef and lamb. Um, unfortunately, I think, David, your customers in China are consuming even more than the Koreans. So maintaining supply out of New Zealand is challenging, uh, but the, the demand is, is absolutely strong. Um, so things are pretty good. Um, the Korean economy, as I said, it has held up uh, very well. It was last year one of the strongest performers in the OECD. This year, others are um, catching up a bit. But Korea continues to grow at about 3%. And we're looking at similar growth uh, next year, maybe slightly less, um, which is overall a, a, a good performance. Um, and there are some very interesting things happening. Um, I'll share with you just a couple before I close. Um, one is in, in the tech sector, where we're seeing a lot of interest out of New Zealand and collaborating with Korean companies in tech. We've run a couple of tech roadshows remotely through the, the pandemic. Um, and there's a lot of interesting work underway in areas like AI, VR, uh, and so on. Um, a second little story is about New Zealand company Skyline, which you'll be familiar with from Rotorua and Queenstown. Uh, they've just opened their second luge track in Korea in Busan, uh, which is doing very well. And you know, they're doing it remarkably well through the pandemic. The last one I wanted to share was just around education, where you know, obviously nothing's been happening in terms of getting new students down to New Zealand. But what we're seeing is an interesting development here with schools um, in Korea getting involved in what they call metaverse education. I think that's what they call it, where they're basically using not just Zooming, but um, AI, VR, virtual reality, and so on to create a kind of a, a metaverse for students to create a more interesting environment uh, for online learning. So this is consistent with New Zealand education, uh, Education New Zealand's approach of saying, rather than just attracting students to New Zealand to teach them there, we're increasingly interested in providing New Zealand education around the world globally. So it's not just come to New Zealand, but work with New Zealand for your education. And as and when um, the restrictions, you know, I hope fall away, it'll be interesting to see how much um, of a change we make in the way we, we promote our educational services as a result of that. So I think that's probably about enough from me. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions later on, but basically the career is, a, is a one, of the, one, of, one of the best places in the world, probably over the last 18 months to have been. And um, New Zealand's business is doing fine. And I think our overall reputation and profile has, if anything, been enhanced by the way New Zealand is seen to have managed the pandemic. Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Philip. It's um it's pretty excellent to hear that Koreans um sitting at home are you know enjoying our wine and foods and and afterwards are working off those calories through uh, going down a luge. So that's that's pretty cool to hear. Um I'd like to introduce our second speaker now, David Mann. David was born in Auckland and has called Beijing his home since 1984. Um, his business Man China Investment Management is to my knowledge anyway, um, the longest established New Zealand owned investment advisory and corporate advisory firm based in the Chinese mainland. Um, David, David and his team have managed five private equity funds over the years and worked with some of New Zealand's leading companies to manage the risks and seize opportunities in the Chinese market. Um, and as part of this, David has been analyzing and commenting on the Chinese political economy and society for more than 30 years. So David, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I will try and describe to you the circumstances here. Um, 
I was in New Zealand all of last year, but I've been back in China since February. So since my return, um, our business has grown. One of the things about COVID we find is that because people can't travel to China, they need more assistance in China. So usually when times are bad here, for advisory and um, management firms like ours, the market's good. China's continued manage of, management of COVID is quite stringent. Uh, in fact, it probably is the tightest in the world. Um, Beijing particularly. The quarantine time required if you live in Beijing is three weeks quarantine in a hotel not in Beijing, and then one week at home. Um, and that still remains. To travel, we need to COVID test out. I'm getting a test on Sunday, which will allow me to land safely in Shanghai on Tuesday. And then I'll have to COVID test back into Beijing um, next weekend. So wherever you go, you're very closely monitored, but it's not a sort of police state type arrangement. It's the public health system. It's pretty convivial. Um, you know, people are uh, kind to the stressed out older people fumbling with their phones to try and find their app and swipe it across the code. How long China can manage the zero tolerance with the Delta variant is a question. Um, they're certainly managing it now and they'll remain pretty closed around these things until I think after the NPC. So we have the Winter Olympics in February and then followed by the National, People's Co National Party Congress. Then things may begin to relax. But there has been an economic cost to this. A lot of service businesses, smaller companies have, have really struggled. Um, there haven't been any lockdowns really since last year, but now we're getting a patchwork of them. One of my colleagues who lives um, 40 minutes drive from me in Beijing city is in a community of 3000 people. It's a cluster of buildings. One family tested positive. The whole building is now restricted from any movement for the next three weeks. So um, that's how tight things are. However, the vaccination rate is over 80%. Um, travel for business between cities that are not Beijing is still pretty fluid. The economy is doing well, um, surprisingly well. People look at the export figures, which have been staggering, but China doesn't really need those. You know, China is now a domestic economy where the internal trade is the main engine. It's been like that for many years, and there's often been an over-focus on the trade account. On the other hand, China does need inputs, and with the global shipping problems and logistics, inflation is creeping into the manufacturing sector, and there are a number of issues for businesses around the fact that it's very hard to predict when you'll get your components and supplies through the ports. So I think there's a bit of an issue next year with inflation. I see a slowing of the economy. We'll probably get 7.5% six, um, five GDP growth this year. I think next year will be lower. It probably be five point something, um, which is more sustainable. The heady growth this year is very much driven by the trade account, but consumption is strong. The service industries are strong. There's new policies, um, which uh, are becoming quite controversial global, globally. It's really, it's the tag is common prosperity. It's really about restructuring the way in which income flows are managed, not just by individuals, but also um, city governments, small, town, small towns and provinces. It's leaving more cash in the pockets of householders. It's allowing them to spend and not save the things that in the past they couldn't rely on because social welfare has expanded due to COVID. Um, so in some ways, there's a look that China's getting, becoming more socialist in a way, it's managing its um, way forward in a co an age of COVID, trying to maintain a level of prosperity and confidence. And I think it's working. The downside are there's rumors that the health app, which is a pretty much an absolute position for anyone to enter a restaurant or go to a public building, can afford tracing to um, the security services. And there are rumors that the families of dissidents about to visit their um, loved ones who are either in detention or um, home detention suddenly go red and they can't move. And there's been a few people, uh, controversial lawyers and journalists that have said the same things. And this is not uncommon in China. It's always been part of the social and security fabric. But overall, I think there's a lot of confidence here. There's a genuine confidence in the way that COVID's being managed. 
in New Zealand, and we've got to be careful here because as New Zealanders, we love to think how well we're thought of, the little country that never loses a rugby or a cricket match. And um, as it turns out, of course, China has had huge problems with its trading partners, and particularly with America and Australia. New Zealand's position has only risen over the last two years here. Um, Jacinda Ardern's government's pretty much followed the John Key and Helen Clark um, traditions in terms of staying away from the heavy criticisms, mentioning things that matter, but it's been well navigated. So it's good to be a New Zealand business in China at the moment. And there's a lot of goodwill towards New Zealand. When people see you're a New Zealander, there's a smile. My Australian friends normally end up getting lectures at banquets and meetings. So um, overall, I think you will see some negative news on China about the economy. Certainly the property sector, it's partly government engineered to move investment elsewhere. And there'll be some softening of consumption as this tight control around the Delta variant has continued. But the underlying economy is strong. China will continue to consume in competition um, with Philip Turner's um, compatriots in, in Seoul. Lots of beef, lots of dairy products. Um, I can't get, I've been trying for some of our Chinese clients to get beef and lamb out of New Zealand. I can't get it. I can't get it out of Europe either. There's a global shortage. But we've increased fruit exports out of China and we've got some berry shipments coming in in the next few months. So anything New Zealand produces is very much in demand here. So I think we're in a very good position, both politically and economically. Um, and to close, one of the issues that will be huge in the press is Xi Jinping's third term. Yes, it will happen in the NPC. Um, one could argue it's necessary. I've come to the view it is not him. Although he wants to do this, it's the party that want him there. And when they don't feel it's appropriate, he will he will change like all the leaders since um, Deng Xiaoping have changed. So I, I cease to see this as the critical political issue it, it has been perceived as. However, if he were to get sick um, or die in office, there is no real succession plan at the moment, and that is one of the big risks here. So um, I think that's a general summary, and I know that time is short, so I'll stop now, and um, perhaps we can have questions at the end. Thanks, David. Um, can I please remind our audience to enter your questions um, for our speakers in the Q&A function um, somewhere down there, and we'll try to get to all the questions um, after everybody speaks. Uh, we now move on to our third and final speaker. Catherine O'Connell is a principal, is the principal and founder of Catherine O'Connell Law, a commercial law firm in Tokyo. Catherine is a lawpreneur and the host of the Lawyer on Air podcast, which I really recommend people to check out. She's also the first non-Japanese female and in fact, the first Kiwi to establish a law firm in Japan. Catherine has been in Japan for over 18 years, working primarily in in-house roles at Panasonic, uh, Olympus, Mitsubishi. She's also been the senior associate at Hogan, Hogan Lovell's law firm in Tokyo, as well as London. Um, I should also mention that Catherine is a vice chair of the Australian and New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in Japan. She's the chair of the Legal Services and IP Committee for the American Chamber of Commerce and the president of the Women in Law Japan. And in fact, I could actually speak about the things that Catherine's done for quite a bit longer, but I'm, I'm looking at the time. So I might just uh, throw it over to you now, Catherine. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much, Charlie. Hello, kia ora and konnichiwa to everyone from Tokyo. And first of all, um, let me share my, uh, my understanding of the official opening up policies here in Japan. But I also just want to say it would be remiss if I did not go back a couple of months to when Tokyo did hold the Olympics and Paralympics during what was a, as you know, a global pandemic and it's been and gone, Japanese athletes, athletes performed at their peak. So did New Zealand, uh, Sophie Pascoe was a star here, a real star in the Paralympics. She appeared on the TV here as well, which is a big kudos to her. Uh, 430 people tested positive during the games. Considering uh, 90,000 athletes and officials came to Japan, uh, you know, that is really a feat uh, for Team Japan to have kept the numbers so low. 
most of them were actually residents in Japan uh, who got the virus. We all waited for the easing of the entry ban into Japan as that Olympic flame was snuffed out, but nothing happened. And then we waited for the election uh, of the new prime minister on October 31 and nothing changed then. But then on November 5th, just this month, an announcement was made that Japan was finally going to lift the travel ban. And there was this initial relief for the 370,000 foreigners who are waiting to move into Japan. These are people for whom the visas have been approved, but because of the ban, they couldn't come into Japan. And there's around 70% 70, 70 of those are students, international students and technical trainees, and 30% are business people who have got long-term jobs secured in Japan. But the lifting of the entry ban only means that people can come here for short term. Business people can come for short term, foreign students and, uh, and technical trainees. And they have to be under the supervision of companies or schools. Uh, so that initial jubilation of hurrah, you know, the, the, the gates are open is not necessarily how it is. And Japan started accepting uh, entry documents from Monday the 8th. So just very recently, but a grey cloud has descended because uh, the paperwork, Japan loves its paperwork, and indeed the paperwork is so daunting. They have to submit six, six forms uh, and has to include an application, a list of arrivals, a written pledge, and a detailed uh, itinerary. And companies have to submit this, these documents three weeks before a person is coming here, and they have to be approved by the various ministries. There is no one-stop shop. So it's the typical uh, bureaucratic uh, system that uh, holds Japan back, unfortunately. So entry applications will also be accepted in order of the date that the visa was approved, not by order of urgency. So they will start approving those that were approved in January to March, not this year, January to March last year. So there's a big backlog. Uh, daily arrivals into Japan are currently capped at 3,500. That will probably go to 5,000 at the end of this month. Of course, the focus is on reopening the borders and striking that balance Charlie mentioned of health and also boot, rebooting the economy. But even the Japan Business Federation, the Care Done Then, have been requesting the government very strongly to simplify this application process and the rules. So, you know, even families and friends who, uh, you know, want to come to Japan are unable to come to Japan, unable to come to Japan, unless there's an urgent humanitarian need. So there's a little bit of mismatch here. And for Kiwi business people wanting to come here, uh, you have to submit those documents three weeks in advance. You need a company or organization here that you belong to that's going to vouch for you. Uh, you have to jump through those paper hoop, paperwork hoops, and then you have to do a quarantine that is shortened. Uh, well, it's portrayed as being shortened to three days, uh, but having a PCR test on the fourth and then uh, a result on the fifth technically means that you're sort of under quarantine for a bit longer than three days. So where are we with the COVID count? This is very interesting in Japan. The last state of emergency, which is what we all call a soft lockdown, that lifted on the 1st of October, so about six and a half weeks ago. And the number of cases have dived down. Uh, we have actually not had a state of, we've, we've been in a state of emergency for most of this year. We only had 28 days of this year that were not in a state of emergency. So COVID numbers have taken a dive. 168 cases a day, um, even Tokyo, two days ago reported only 15 cases. Quite remarkable. Um, since the pandemic began, 1.7 million infections in total, 18,500 coronavirus related deaths, and Japan's administered 194 million doses of the vaccine and 77.2% of the population uh, are now vaccinated. Uh, there'll be another 70 days until another 10% is covered. So. 70 days to get to 87% of the entire population vaccinated. So Japan was a slow starter, but has really ramped it up. And I'm totally proud of Japan the way it's behaved in this way. So turning to some other interesting things that might be uh, hopefully of interest to everybody there, but uh, in terms of monetary stimulus, uh, as I mentioned, PM uh, Prime Minister Kishida was elected as Prime Minister on 31st of October. And one of the first things he did was to announce a stimulus 
for post-pandemic recovery. But only one in five Japanese people are satisfied with this uh, stimulus package. It's simply a handout of 100,000 yen, about 880 New Zealand dollars in cash and vouchers, not all cash, vouchers uh, for people who have a child under 18 years of age. Um, the average income in Japan is 4.4 million yen and the threshold is actually a little bit higher. So a lot of people are gonna miss out on this uh, handout. So it's not quite as good as it is rumored to be, but he hopes to increase his popularity by doing this. Some interesting news about a new COVID drug innovation, a Japanese company, VLP Therapeutics Japan, has launched the first phase of a clinical trial here for a new COVID-19 vaccine, which can induce a sufficient Im immunity with smaller dosages. And they hope to put that through uh, the end of clinical trials in spring next year and bring it out to Japan and other countries at the end of the year. Apparently, this drug only requires one tenth to one hundredth of the dosage of the current vaccines. So let's watch this space. I think that's very exciting coming out of uh, Japan. Next, I'd love to give you an outlook of for uh, Japan from Japanese people. And then I talked to some Kiwis on the ground here and I've got their raw voice to tell you what they are thinking about the pathways opening up. Um, so about Japan and Japanese people, a Kyodo news survey recently uh, showed 90% of 111 major Japanese companies who were surveyed including, for example, Toyota and Sony. Uh, they expect the economy to expand in 2022 on the basis of this uh, pandemic subsiding and the increase in the coronavirus vaccinations. 83% see uh, a recovery in private, uh, in private consumption uh, by the, the average person around the street. 72% uh, pinned their hopes on easing these coronavirus restrictions. And so these are really good numbers, I think, reflecting Japanese business sentiment. It's really up, up and up in Japan. Um, the Nikkei this morning reported that uh, Japan's considering letting foreign nationals working in farming, you heard it, farming, food service and other sectors to be able to remain in the country indefinitely. And this is actually a significant turning point for Japan because usually Japan keeps its borders pretty tightly closed to long-term immigrants, unless you are a speciality occupation like engineering or a lawyer, for example. But because Japan faces this big aging population and uh, a labor shortage, uh, they will bring people in and this will be a major shift to Japan's immigration policy. So let's see what happens here. Moving to New Zealand companies and likely pathways that they see in 2022. And I think this is hopefully going to be good for everybody. So get your pen and paper ready. But um, in the first webinar series this year and, and second, I went to the horse's mouth and asked Kiwi companies uh, about their, their views. And I've collated the raw answers. So the good, the bad and the ugly. I asked them what was the outlook? Uh, and what opportunities they see for New Zealand companies coming into Japan post-pandemic recovery? Are there any opportunities and gaps? One company I asked said this, and I'll read it. Personally, I'm not convinced that we are out of the woods with regards to COVID-19. I think it is wise for New Zealand and New Zealand businesses to be prepared to live with COVID disruptions on an ongoing basis, uh, even acknowledging that New Zealand's at uh, more than 80% vaccinated. Uh, so how to minimize disruptions in a realistic and sustainable matter is going to be uh, very important for New Zealand to increase its credibility as a trading partner. This Kiwi went on to say that much like you said, um, Philip, on the ground in Japan, it also feels very much like Japanese business are just getting up and operating as normal, regardless of the, the waves of infection. This particular person had been presenting at uh, their products at trade shows throughout the year. So trade, trade shows were held even uh, despite these waves of COVID cases. And I agree with this. The trains are running, uh, the bars are open, uh, it's business as usual. The foot traffic in shops is up. It's quite frightening going there because there's so many people, but everyone, of course, is all uh, wearing masks. And I mean frightening because there's just a surge of people after zero for so long. So continuing what this person said, he thinks if New Zealand can emulate a kind of pragmatic approach uh, and be able to differentiate ourselves, there should be uh, room for us amongst all these other uh, global uh, trans um, disruptions that are happening. 
Uh, I also asked what are the implications for New Zealand companies in Japan uh, regarding supply chain, et cetera. And the response was that the supply chain is actually difficult um, and the situation is not fixed. Uh, we need to, people here are holding more stock than they would like to so that they don't have any shortages. They are all looking forward to New Zealand representatives coming back to Japan and they are planning for that to happen in March so that they can make big moves on the ground here. Um, it's been a real force of resistance to uh, Japan and not being able to do business in person. It's a very business in person uh, country. And I'm envious of what you were able to do last night, Philip, with your team there and uh, supplying the New Zealand products to your colleagues and friends. Uh, a further question I asked was how has Japan transformed over the last 12 months, especially around digital transformation, which is a hot topic. Uh, and the answer was pretty clear that some signs of digital reform are taking hold but there's still a lot of rubber stamping and shuffling paperwork and red tape. Uh, and again, just not having that face-to-face -face, uh, communication is really taking its toll still. Um, and then I asked some businesses again, just as the last question I asked them was uh, what they can do now or next. Um, they recommended keeping an ear to your customer and to the export markets. Don't allow yourself to hide in a shell in the face of these headwinds. Uh, communicate openly and honestly with your customer. Uh, avoid optimism on your guidance on delivery times. Have a plan for COVID if it indeed becomes seasonal, as seems to be what people are thinking it's going to be. Uh, and observing from here, several people who are operating businesses as Kiwis here said, that brand New Zealand is facing challenges at the moment. As a business leader, please ensure that the New Zealand environment continues to encourage diversity, critical, critical thinking and problem solving and lobby the government where you can. And uh, just I'd like to finish on an up higher note, which is a few hot trends that are on here, three to give you. Sleep tech, sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. Japanese love to sleep. It's become a craze in Silicon Valley, but also hitting Japan, people maximizing their sleep using an array of technologies. I think this is a place where New Zealand uh, can export its technology. And these are headbands that people wear when they're sleeping, smart alarm clocks, things like that. Related to that, secondly, personalized nutrition is super hot and wearing health trackers, but really advanced health trackers, which people are calling a clinic on the wrist. Uh, and that allows people to also track, track things that weren't doing, they weren't doing before, glucose and blood level, blood alcohol levels. <laughs> Sounds scary to me for someone who likes a little bit of wine. I don't really think I'll go with those. But, you know, wearables is a place where I think tech savvy Kiwis can play. And then there are virtual influences. And as you were talking there, Philip, about uh, the metaverse, I thought the same thing, that the, there are virtual influences that are hot as ever in Japan. Like, unlike a human influencer who was always late for a few photo shoot and they grow old, these um, virtual influencers are computer generated characters, you know, and they're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Virtual influencers in Japan, Liam, Imma and Aoi Prism are the best known in Japan. This market is worth $15 billion uh, and expected to be a massive area uh, influencer marketing in 2022. So um, tech savvy companies in New Zealand as well, if you can get into this, you're going to be rocking. So on that note, that's me coming to you virtually, but not computer generated, uh, finishing up my presentation for Japan. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Catherine. That was um, that was so comprehensive. Um, I, I think I need to check out some of the sleep tech for myself. Um, I suspect for me it's going to be around setting up a tent and putting the boys outside for the evening. Um, but if there's technology to help, that that sounds pretty cool. Um, can we get David and uh, David and Philip are on the screen as well? Awesome. Um, I think I'll launch right into the audience questions. I I had a few, but I think let's give our audience um, an opportunity. Um, so here's one for each of you from Lynn. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right from Lynn. Um, and Lynn is wondering if um, Kiwi businesses can expect, um, you know, a sort of quarantine free experience. Um, I know that some of you touched on this a little bit, but what is the sort of general experience that Kiwi companies can expect heading into uh, Korea and then uh, China and Japan? We start with you, Philip, around um, what Kiwis can probably expect in Korea 
is it pretty smooth now? Sure, sure. Thanks, John. If you can hear me, yeah. Um, so as I touched on before, it's pretty good here. Um, obviously, I won't comment on the experience of getting back into New Zealand, which is a real challenge, including for the businessman I was with last night. You know, so you've got to worry about MIQ and so on. But you're all very aware of that. In terms of getting into Korea, as I said, since July, uh, it's relatively straightforward for business travelers. You need to be vaccinated and you need a PCR test and you'll be tested on arrival. If you do all that, uh, the vaccination process means you've got to go to the Korean embassy and get a, an exemption certificate, uh, which is a bit of a hassle. But once you've got that, you are exempt from quarantine on arrival. Now, I should stress that that only applies to business travel. You need a business visa. Uh, so for ordinary, you know, other ordinary travelers, that's still um, problematic. Uh, there is normally a visa-free scheme between New Zealand and Korea, whereby you can come in for 90 days as a tourist um, or an ordinary traveler. That is still suspended. Uh, so you know, there's no mass tourism at the moment into Korea. But for business travel or people with that, you know, who can, as a bit like Catherine was describing in Japan, if you can find a sponsoring organization uh, to, uh, or you have a good justification for coming, uh, you can you can get in um, without quarantine and uh, do your business. Uh, but mass tourism is going to be take longer. As I said, Korea has started opening travel bubbles to the likes of Singapore, Thailand. Uh, Guam, and I think that will probably be extended um, in the next month or two. Uh, they're doing that on the basis of uh, obviously countries with high demand and good COVID records. And I know they are keen to extend that to New Zealand. So I think the ball's in our court as to whether New Zealand is able to respond to that. I'll leave it at that, Charlie. Thanks, Philip. Um, David, um, maybe we should go to you around the picture in China. Um, it seems like perhaps the most restrictive of the three North Asian countries at the moment when it comes to people trying to come in. Um, are there any discussions around when that might change and how it might change? And I guess as a sort of um, something that's quite related to that is around the elimination strategy itself. Now you've touched on this a little bit in your talk, but um, I mean, what is the outlook for elimination? China seems to be one of the last countries around that's still um, at least talking about elimination, whereas in New Zealand, that's obviously changed quite a lot. So um, yeah, so those two parts, I guess. I think for elimination, um, China's situation is unique. The population size, the density of people's living circumstances is such that they've got to be very careful. I think they have something like half the number of hospital beds in the cities as Britain, which doesn't sound dramatic, but it's huge because it means that if there was any surge in cases, then um, the system wouldn't cope. Like New Zealand, that's been one of the drivers. How much can your hospital system cope with? So they're being very conservative. It also tracks into an instinct here. I mean, this is the country that built the Great Wall. Was it to keep people in or keep people out? It was a bit of both. This is also the country that closed its borders through many dynasties. You know, the great travelers to China like Marco Polo or Matteo Ricci in the um, 14th century spent years in, in cities before they could actually get away from confinement and travel in the country. I think it will be slow. An example is the head of Zespri has just left, Daniel Matheson. He flew in from Singapore, which has some advantages. He spent two weeks in quarantine in his hotel in Shanghai, one week re restricted to the city, and then a total of five weeks in China. You know, we traveled together down to Yunnan and places. He had to have quite a program to justify the time he was basically um, locked down. So I think it'll be a while. I think it'll be slow. But any country that initiate open their borders, and I think this is to Philip's point, if New Zealand makes some sort of initiative, I think China will move very quickly to try and accommodate it for a small country. The rumors are that for Chinese New Year, Cantonese people can travel and visit their relatives in Hong Kong and vice versa. So in a contained way, that might occur. So I think they'll They'll experiment with it. They won't announce it's changed. I think people will just find it becomes easier at some stage next year to get visas. But I think we'll be the last to open. And I think the Chinese are falling back on an historical comfort with relative isolation, unfortunately. Thanks, David. Um, Catherine, how's it looking in Japan? I mean, I guess not just for business tours, um, business travelers, but um, so many of us have enjoyed 
uh, visiting Japan and all that it has to offer. So when can that perhaps happen again? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I basically covered the, the quarantine situation mm. where if you file that paperwork, get through all those barriers, you can come into Japan for a short term uh, as a business person and stay for uh, three days in quarantine, have the testing, be out. But then basically for the remainder of the time, I think it's up to 10 days, you are still uh, being monitored uh, on your travel and where you go and what you're doing. So it's, it's pretty restrictive in that way. I've also heard that... Um, if you're out and about between those day day four and day 10, you are still um, not able to do certain activities like travel to other areas. So if it's Tokyo, outside of Tokyo, uh, not allowed to meet with groups of friends. That hasn't been disclosed publicly yet, but it's, it's the rumors that we've heard through se several uh, reputable places. So it's still going to be quite restrictive. Uh, Japan desperately wants um, visitors back, especially from David's part of town, which is China. Uh, China's been a, a massive uh, supporter in Japan and, and China and Japan's economies are really very well linked, I think. And so they'd love to have them back. But the problem that Japan is facing, they do want the tourists back, but how to track people while they're here. And that's the difficulty. So I think for some time soon, uh, this will still be limited quarantine. Uh, still restrictive, but Japan's got a backlog to get through. So once they get through the 370,000 people, perhaps they'll be able to uh, work on the next stage. But you can guarantee that Japan's working on it in the background, as they were all through the Olympics, all through the election, because that's how they could announce on the 5th of November. If they were doing no work on it, we wouldn't have heard anything. So they're, work, uh, they're, they're working on it, but it'll just take time, very slowly and casually, uh, not casually, cautiously. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we've actually had a couple of questions on this sort of rough theme. Um, we've had a question from Luke around how are people reacting to the measures uh, in, in China? Um, and that's another question just around in each of the countries, um, there's varying levels of restrictions, but it's been a long time now. You know, we can see that in New Zealand, um, well, I mean, I can say for us Aucklanders, it's getting increasingly tough and I think we're doing our best, but the sort of um, ability for people to keep going is sometimes, uh, well, I think it's limited. So I was just wondering if we could go around and if you could share your sense and, you know, how are Koreans and Japanese and Chinese people in the public faring with the ongoing restrictions? You know, are they starting to fray? Um, are they starting to uh, ask questions more than they were, um, you know, a few months ago? So, um, uh, Philip, could we start with you again to see, um, yeah, the Korean public picture here? Uh, you might be muted, Philip. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's not a proper Zoom uh, call unless one person is muted at some point, so that's good. Yeah, right. Uh, look, it's, it's it's tricky to kind of be a direct comparison without actually traveling around and experiencing what other countries are feeling. Um, so I'd be a bit cautious, but I think the Koreans are actually not as frustrated as some others. Um, one thing is we don't see any sign yet of the sort of um, um, protests, demonstrations, particularly from our vaccination resistors or people who just resent the government telling them what to do, you know, and putting restrictions on their individual freedoms, even though in Korea, this, you know, we are seeing a little bit of discrimination in the sense that if, if you are vaccinated, you will be freer to do things. But we haven't seen demonstrations and people getting on, um, getting up, upset about that yet. Uh, having said that, I think there is as everywhere, you know, quite a lot of frustration that this thing just goes on and on and on. And just when you think it's it's getting better, you know, there's another wave, a fourth wave, a fifth wave. That drives people nuts. You know, it's just very frustrating when everybody, there's a, uh, a frustration about not being able to travel very much overseas, even though that is easing up now. Um, you know, enormous numbers of Koreans flooding to Jeju because it's the only place you can really travel to. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, you know, mask wearing everywhere, restrictions on large events, weddings, funerals, you know, these things, they just take their toll and create a general sense of, of I think I would describe it as, as fatigue and frustration, um, but not as aggressively expressed as in some other parts of the world. Charlie. Thanks, Philip. Um, David, is the level of sort of compliance and public sentiment still reasonably positive? Yes, um, almost unfailingly. There's no 
no one, even old friends in a restaurant late at night in Shanghai are not complaining about the, the restrictions. Everyone knows that while it might not be for them, there are those who are vulnerable in society, whether they have impaired health or they're old. Um, the other thing is that for Beijing, because the government's here and because the Winter Olympics are coming, if you are traveling and you have children, it's a big issue. And um, the senior women, as you remember, Charlie and my company are women. Um, they have children of school age, all of them. So um, uh, I'm doing 50% of the traveling and interaction at the moment. Because if we came back from somewhere where there had been a case, it may be that their family had to lock down and their child couldn't go to school. So it's very inconvenient, but no one's complaining. And the thing is that um, people are doing business with the same intensity, the same enthusiasm. On virtual, we do a lot of Zoom calls, um, a lot of WeChat communications. On the streets, yes, mask wearing is pretty common. Um, it certainly is anywhere where people are crowded. But if you go down the streets of Shanghai, people generally are um, maybe 70% masked, 30% not. So there's a kind of a, people are rolling with it. I think the quality here is not so much obedience, but a sense of endurance and patience, which is one of the things that's stood China in good stead through its economic reform. So it's not bad. Mm. Thanks, David. Catherine, how is it looking in Japan? I'd say similar to David, that endurance and patience um, and Japanese people here were pretty frustrated at the beginning. It reached its height, I think, at the beginning of the Olympics. Why so many people coming here and we're all locked down and we can't go to the stadium uh, and see any of these sports? It was all remote. So we knew a games was happening in the town, but, you know, no one could go anywhere near there just outside the stadium for a few selfies. And that was about it with the uh, Olympic rings. So there was a lot of frustration, but I think not really voiced so much, just uh, you could feel it almost in the air. It was quite heavy, but now that's gone past and things have lifted. And as I said before, you know, I live in a place where it's very close to get to a bar, probably about a hundred meters down the road and they're all open and people are back. They're wearing masks, of course, wearing masks during dinner and drinking, but only taking it off to drink, put it back on again. It's probably slowed down the pace of people drinking, I think. Uh, but it's all, I think, become very buoyant. Uh, the thing is really about the future of work and where people are going to be doing their work um, and what's happening with the hybrid kind of style. Most people are returning to work. In fact, some people didn't even do remote work uh, during the pandemic. There were a couple of companies I spoke to and a couple of lawyers who went into the office every single day, uh, a work day that they could. And so there's really a little bit of disagreement about the details of how to go back to work, mm -hmm. how many days a week, who's going back. And I think I've heard recently that, you know, um, a lot of women are worried about that because if they stay away from the office, they may lose their uh, place in the promotion line. So mm -hmm. I think being really crystal clear amongst uh, Japanese at the moment about what the return to work policies look like mm -hmm. uh, is really important. You've heard about this great resignation as well. That's on the minds of many people here. Uh, Microsoft surveyed uh, people and found that 41% of workers wanted to quit their job. And in Japan, a recent survey by one of the big uh, four consultancies indicated that 63% of Japanese want to leave their job. So we've got this sort of massive change through this, the remote work hesitancy, hybrid, how you do that. And that's going to be a big challenge for Japan uh, at the moment, I think, going forward. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Dean has asked um, uh, Catherine actually um, around, um, you know, how is Japan or is Japan still attracting foreigners in the right areas? Um, I, I'm actually quite keen to sort of broaden that to um, all three speakers, because if you look at New Zealand right now, um, one of the things that maybe earlier in the piece we didn't see coming is just how dependent the labor market over here um, was um, in several sectors, um, certainly hospitality, um, the agriculture sector. Um, and that's having, um, I think, some quite notable effects now. And there isn't really an easy solution here in New Zealand. Um, I was wondering, what is the picture like in Korea, um, China, and Japan, where I think traditionally perhaps um, fewer um, sort of immigrants may go into these countries? But still, I'd say foreign labor force is an important sort of factor and input. So, um, Philip, what is the picture in Korea um, now that? people aren't really going there as much. Yeah. Uh, Korea is um, 
got relatively low numbers of foreign uh, immigrants, but of you know under that they are concentrated in certain uh, areas where there's you know the, the locals there's, there's not um, local labour supply, uh, particularly farming, uh, and there's quite a, a lot of uh, farming uh, women who come to marry into into farming communities, or uh, workers, and in, in manufacturing uh, and uh, low wage service industries. A lot of folk from Southeast Asia, in particular. Um, I think that what how the, what's happening at the moment is it's largely being kind of frozen. Um, obviously, coming into the country is possible but difficult, uh, and so people are just basically trying to kind of staying where they are, um, and employers are trying to keep the staff they have and try and dissuade them from going back to their own countries. So I, I think my sense in Korea is that that issue is sort of frozen for now. Um, and the longer we have no clarity on immigration settings, um, that risks becoming problematic. But so far, there's you know, tight labour markets, but it hasn't emerged yet as a major problem. Uh, David. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, COVID globally has been uh, beyond the restrictions and the things of our personal and professional lives. It's something that's happening on the planet. I mean, it's a natural virus. It's out there. Um, interestingly, research here, which no one seems to be talking about these things much, but they've found historical cases in, in a series of caves in the mountains of China, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Laos. So that's been going on. I think Oxford University was looking at in the post-SARS era. So they're beginning to find there's a nexus of this virus. So my view is it's just part of humanity. What is it telling us? A lot of things. Um, that pressure on work satisfaction, what do you think of your company, what about the pastoral environment that you're working in. As an employer, I found that a big challenge back in China. As you know, we're a very small team, Charlie, but um, I'm having to deal with a whole lot of pressures which on people's lives working at home, particularly women in this environment that go to work at home. The burden of doing everything else at home, which they have to do often anyway, is, is huge. So these are things which are really have been catalysts and they're giving people choices to perhaps make change or consider making changes. The other thing that's highlighted here is the class system. It's an anathema to mention it in a so-called communist socialist country, but there's definitely a class system of those who are connected, educated, live in cities, live in the countryside, and migrant labor has slowed. A lot of people are not coming out of the countryside as they normally would, and they're not tr tracked in the unemployment figures at any time. So that's a very interesting part of and sort of under it's not destabilizing, but it is a significant factor in the community. So for outside workers, once this passes, China's openness to anyone who's got skills to work here is going to increase, emphasized by the, the trade war with America and the marginalization of relationships like Australia. So for New Zealand, I think anyone with real skills who's keen to come and do something, once this is passed, there'll be a great appetite for professional skills and for people who want to come and study and make a life here. So I see that as the upside going forward. It's good to hear it, David. Um, Catherine, you touched a little bit um, on some mm. of these employment issues. Um, but yeah, I, I guess if you wanted to expand on that really quickly, now so around the foreigners coming in, um, part well, of Well, it's just been closed gates, so nobody could come in. And I think, you know, thank you, Dean, for your ex excellent question and for joining today. It's tough. I mean, we couldn't get anybody in. I've got clients who wanted to come and sell their products in Japan and they couldn't get in. And we tried all kinds of ways. How could that happen? To set up a company, you needed to have a bank account open uh, with 5 million yen in there. How can they do that without somebody coming here to do it? How do you find someone to do that? Uh, you could get a representative, but are you going to pay them 5 million yen uh, and then get your money back later when you finally can come into the country? So it's very hard to do business. Uh, I think that news out of the Nikkei this morning is great. Uh, it's farming, food service, and other sectors. So we look forward to seeing what they are. Meantime, e-commerce has been phenomenal in Japan. It's been an 80% uptick in that during COVID-19. So businesses in New Zealand who are selling online, you're there, right? So digital economy, getting into this farming and food sector, environment, sustainability, low carbon future, SDGs, Japanese are wearing those badges with the pretty colors. They know what SDGs now mean. Uh, everything's going to be going in those areas, hydrogen and space. So those are the areas and to the extent possible, I think Dean, they should be done online. 
Uh, and when the gates can open, you can fully come in here, just just come and, and start doing business because that's the way Japanese like to do business. But mm -hmm. I think there's plenty to do if you uh, have that Kiwi ingenuity number eight wire attitude and get out there on the on the e-commerce side of things. That's where it's really uh, singing so well at the moment. Well, thanks, Catherine. I think that's a really great um, sort of note to end it. Um, apologies to um, you know some of our um, audience who've asked questions we haven't had time, so apologies for that. Um, I just really want to thank um, all three speakers, uh, Philip, David, Catherine, for your time. Um, thank you also for um, being champions for New Zealand overseas. Um, I'm sure there are moments where you would rather be back. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's moments, um, but having you over there, I think, is um, yeah, it's a real, it's a real asset and a real, really valuable for the rest of us. Um, so thank you very much. Um, a big thank you to the North Asia Cape team. Um, a lot of work goes into organizing these things and in the back end. Um, so especially in this case, thank you to Laura and Ewan, who've done a lot um, behind the scenes here. Um, and yeah, finally, thank you to the audience. I mean, sort of, we, we wouldn't do this without you. We've had a really good turnout today. Um, I hope that um, you've learned something useful, but also, um, yeah, just enjoyed the time that we have with our Kiwis overseas. So thank you so much for joining. Um, so on that, um, just wishing everyone on the call good health um, and see you again. Mate wa. Thank you. Thanks. Kia ora. See you all. Kia ora. Bye-bye.